Hello my fellow scientists. Today, since COVID-19 is in the news so much, I thought I'd take a few minutes to go through how the COVID-19 test works. This test is the one recommended by the CDC, but it's not the only test, and I'm going to be going over this at a pretty high level, so if you want the details, uh, you can certainly find lots of information about these kind of tests elsewhere. But for folks who aren't familiar with quantitative polymerase chain reaction tests, I thought this might be interesting. So what's the big picture? The big picture is that if you take a sample, like from a swab of someone's nasal mucosa, you're going to end up with lots of biological junk, right? That's the human cells, mucus, any random bits of dust people have breathed in, uh, pollen, you name it. All that stuff is mixed together and added to a sample. And how do you differentiate samples that also happen to contain viral DNA from those that don't? This is kind of a tough problem, right? Because DNA at a very high level all looks very, very similar. We need a test that's very specific for the specific sequence of the virus in question. What we really want is to be able to say, take a bunch of samples, one that definitely contains the viral genes, that's going to be your positive control, one that definitely doesn't, that's our negative control, and then we want to have some way to make the viral positive samples glow or otherwise indicate their presence so that we can make sure that samples of unknown viral contamination do or do not have the virus. So one way to do that is using the polymerase chain reaction. The way that works is you take your sample and if it contains the viral RNA, we're going to copy that viral RNA to DNA and then amplify that DNA. So if there's viral DNA, we're going to get a signal. And if there's no viral RNA, then we won't copy it to DNA and we won't get a signal. What do I mean by copy? What I mean is that first, you apply a primer, that primer is going to sit down on the RNA and allow it to be copied to DNA. It uses some enzymes that I'm not going to get into. Then you take that DNA and it also has a primer that sits down and allows that to be copied. The specificity of the test for this specific RNA and DNA comes from that primer. So if the primer matches the target, you get amplification and you get signal. If the primer doesn't match, you don't. After you've matched the copied DNA, you make a copy of the copy. You now have two copies. You can then make a copy of each of those copies. You now have four copies and so on over multiple cycles of this process. Now, after you've run many cycles, you have a ton of the specific DNA you're after if the RNA was present in the first place. And thus you can just look to see if your sample is glowing in response to the virus. That overcomes this sort of background of all the other DNA in the system because only the DNA of interest is being amplified. There's another level on top of this though. You can use an instrument called, a, in this case, a real-time PCR or a quantitative PCR, RT-PCR or qPCR. This is the instrument I have. It's a open source, open qPCR. It does 16 samples at a time. The commercial large-scale instruments can do 96 or even 384 samples in one run, which makes them better for, say, clinical testing. This instrument works the same way. It copies and then copies the copies and then copies those copies, but it does so while measuring at each cycle how much of the product is present. So the way that works is we're going to have time on the x-axis and fluorescence, that is to say glowiness, on the y-axis. And the more fluorescence there is, the more DNA there must have been. Now, we're going to do two samples, one of which does not have the virus, and the other which does have the virus. So we're going to have a negative and a positive sample. Now, at each point on the negative case, we're going to have zero, doubled is zero, doubled is zero. But in the positive case, if we started at, say, 1,000 DNA molecules worth of fluorescence, that isn't even going to show up on this scale, which goes up to, say, a million. But after two cycles, you have 4,000 molecules worth of fluorescence, and then 8, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64, and that's starting to show up, and then 128, which is 10% up the scale, and then 256, and then 512 halfway up, and finally, at 10 cycles, you have the full million worth of DNA. So that 
gives you some idea of how quickly you can amplify from thousand molecules up to a million molecules and thereby get a strong signal in the positive case. Now in the negative case, eventually this system will produce something that amplifies and so you do get a signal at say 40 cycles but the delta, the difference between the 40 in the negative case and the 10 in the positive case is going to be bigger the more DNA you started with. So for that reason we can call this quantitative PCR. According to the independent there were some problems with one of the primer sets recommended by the CDC for doing these tests for the COVID-19 virus. There are lots of things that can go wrong with primers. I'm sure the CDC did all the due diligence to make as good a primers as they could, but the things that can go wrong, for instance, is you could have a primer that binds to some other random DNA in nature, and that that then starts to copy, and you don't want copies of some random DNA, you want copies of the viral DNA, or RNA in this case. Uh, you could also have primers that bind to each other, thus they cross amplify and produce copies even when there's no viral RNA present. Those I don't think the CDC will have made those elementary mistakes, but one thing that can happen is that if the virus mutates and changes, then these primers are no longer relevant. Did that happen in this case? I don't know, but it's one possible thing that could happen. In any case, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, please tune in every week. We talk about science, science news, and occasionally our own results right here in the Allen Lab.